Good morning friends and uh, today we're going to discuss about uh, physics of anesthesia machine. Uh, my name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh and I'm a consultant in anesthesia working in Liverpool, UK. Before we start off with the machines, uh, we need to actually know a few equations uh, which uh, will be used in explaining uh, certain components uh, which are used in the anesthesia machine. Uh, first one is this uh, mass is equal to volume into density. Uh, force is a product of mass into acceleration. Uh, flow is nothing but volume over unit time. But flow is also equal to pressure or resistance. And because of this, pressure is a product of flow into resistance. And pressure is also defined as force acting over unit area. We also need to know a few conversation or conversion factors like one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury which is equal to 101 kPa uh, which is uh, one bar and equal to 10.33 meters of water or 14.7 psi now the machines over the years have actually evolved from simple pneumatic machines uh, to complex electrical, mechanical, and pneumatic multi-component workstations. Now, if you have a seen, observed this machine, now this is uh, one of the latest machines. It does not even, even have the flow meters, uh, uh, which we had in the older machines. So a lot of it is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, electronically controlled and uh, uh, computerized systems. So anesthesia machinery, uh, machine circuitry can be quite complex <clears throat> and uh, difficult to understand, uh, but we're going to simplify it for you. So if we actually have to look at the anesthesia machine, this is how simple it is. So any modern uh, anesthesia machine uh, includes the supply uh, which actually comes from the uh, uh, through pipeline and uh, in the pipeline it can come from the vacuum insulator evaporators or a bank of cylinders the oxygen can also come from the uh, cylinders uh, which are at the back of the machine so once this oxygen supply comes in then it is processed by the machine and then it is delivered from the machine uh, to the patient uh, via a breathing uh, system and the you know the waste gases are disposed of using scavenging so this is all uh, as simple as it is so there is supply there is processing there is delivery and, and there is disposal and this is known as the SPDD model so supply basically is about how do gases reach the anesthesia machine. Like I've explained, they can come through the pipeline from a VIE or banks of cylinders in the manifold room or from cylinders at the back of the machine. Processing is about how does the anesthesia gas machine that prepares gases which are coming at a very high pressure uh, before they are delivered to the patient and this is done uh, through flow meters there are the main flow meters uh, which we control or they can be auxiliary flow meter as well uh, which can be used to connect a separate anesthesia circuit or oxygen uh, you know through venturi uh, devices uh, within the machine we have vaporizers uh, to maintain anesthesia for patients there are check valves distal to the vaporizers to prevent back pressure they can be second stage regulators to further reduce the pressure within the machine. There are devices which actually prevents a delivery of hypoxic mixture. These are called fail safe devices or oxygen pressure failure devices. There are alarms for low oxygen pressure alarms. They can be proportionating system. These are also known as hypoxia guard. That means that you cannot deliver nitrous oxide on its own. 
Then there might be ventilator driving gas to drive the ventilators on the machine. All, all modern machines come with ventilators. And then there is oxygen flush. That is if you need to actually give oxygen at a very high flow. For example, in patients uh, who actually develop laryngospasm. So we have the oxygen flush as well. Uh, delivery uh, is about how the interaction of gases uh, occur uh, with the patient and how these are controlled and monitored. So there is a common gas outlet to which a breathing systems are actually attached. These can be non-breathing, rebreathing systems, so they can be spherical systems. There are also ventilators uh, which drive the gases uh, for the patient. And so instead of you squeezing the bag, the ventilators will do for you. They can be additional PEEP devices. They are part of uh, usually of the ventilators, but you can also attach uh, additional PEEP devices to your breathing system as well. And they can be means of humidification. If you're using a circle system, then you don't need that. But if you want, you can also have means of humidification as well. There are integral monitors to monitor the oxygen amount delivered to the patient, which is very important. And there can be discussion, disconnection along which are within the uh, uh, breathing, uh, breathing circuits, sorry, attached within the uh, machine itself. Then there can be integrated uh, spirometry, uh, capnography, uh, airway pressure monitoring devices, ventilator alarms uh, within the system. Now how uh, the gases which are not uh, used up by the patient, the axis or uh, you know the, these gases, how they're disposed of. Uh, for that we have the scavenging system, so they can be open type of scavenging system or closed which can again be active or passive system. Uh, this is a, a lecture on its own. So if we look at the uh, machine, uh, this is a schematic diagram. And so all this, the SPDD model is actually uh, described here. And so we look at the source, uh, which is uh, coming through the pipeline from the VIE or banks of cylinder, or it can come from cylinder, which is at the back of the machine. Uh, you obviously need a pressure regulating valve for cylinders, uh, which are at the back of the machine. Uh, so this gas flow uh, then goes to the uh, flow meter. Uh, at this level, we can have oxygen flush, uh, which bypasses the flow meters. And there are uh, fail-safe uh, devices like oxygen pressure failure devices or proportionating systems uh, to prevent hypoxia. Then there is uh, vaporizers uh, within the processing system. And uh, there is oxygen, uh, uh, low oxygen pressure alarm system uh, before the oxygen are delivered to the common gas outlet. And uh, so the delivery system is attached to the ca common gas outlet. So this is a breathing system. And uh, at the breathing system, we can actually have capnography, airway pressure monitoring devices, PEEP devices. Then uh, there are ventilators, uh, which can drive the gases uh, from the breathing system for us. And there are uh, ventilator alarms. There are also oxygen analysis. Uh, uh, you know, using oxygen analyzers, there are disconnection alarms, uh, spirometry attached at this uh, level as well. And in the end, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, gases are scavenged uh, through the scavenging system. This is a disposable or disposal uh, part of the SPDD model. There's another classification based on the pressure within the system. So we have the high pressure system, which includes your VIE pipelines, the cylinders. Then there can be intermediate pressure system within uh, within that where there is second stage regulator. And then we have the low pressure system which starts from the uh, flow meters onwards till the patient end. So if we uh, start with the sources and uh, like I said, the sources includes the uh, cylinders and the VIE. And uh, the VIE is also known as the cryogenic uh, liquid system or CLS and this you can actually find outside the hospital system. Uh, they are obviously uh, a, a dangerous system. They have high uh, oxygen levels or they can come from the manifold rooms which are within the, uh, you know, the hospital. 
and uh, the pipeline you can actually see that the cylinders are actually H type cylinders and these are at 4 745 psi very high pressure and there are pressure regulators within the system uh, which will reduce the pressure to around 50 to 60 psi in the pipeline these are the VIEs and uh, you can actually see them as uh, you know in the outside the hospital uh, in the open and uh, if you look closely you can actually see the eyes over the uh, you know the pipes outside so basically the VI is is like a thermal flask uh, where which holds the cold or the hot inside so whatever you put in uh, if it is cold it remains cold with hot remains hot and so this consists of two uh, layers uh, which are separated by uh, uh, you know insulation and uh, so or the, or the vacuum uh, between the two uh, so in cases of VIE the outer uh, part is made of carbon steel and inner part is made of stainless steel now the vacuum uh, between the two layers is is insulated as uh, uh, you know and is, is filled with a insulating powder known as a perlite and uh, this is obviously filled with liquid uh, oxygen which is actually stored at minus 183 degrees celsius so it's very very cold and uh, the gaseous part of it uh, has the uh, is at uh, a pressure of 180 psi and this has got a different uh, ports as well so you have the filling port uh, from where the liquid oxygen is poured into and uh, the gaseous form comes from the top there's also a safety valve at the top so when the pressure increases too too much then it will be vented out and the lower part there is actually also a, a you know a system uh, through port through which the liquid oxygen can be uh, withdrawn during uh, requirement high requirement and then it passes through uh, a, a vaporizer and the uh, where the amount is measured is by differential pressure and uh, so it measures the pressure at the top and the bottom and this is known as bottom bottom's curves in the old types they used to actually have three legs two legs are fixed one is on a hinge and the hinged leg used to be on a on a scale and uh, from the scale you could actually make out how much oxygen is there in the liquid form so it used to be the old types but in the modern one it's just using a differential pressure uh, monitoring the gas is actually passed through a main vaporizer as well and uh, they are actually at very high pressure when they're coming out uh, so they are at around uh, 1055 kPa or uh, 150 psi or 10.5 bar so these are now then brought down uh, using pressure regulators to 4 uh, bar which is around uh, 60 psi so that is the uh, output to the pipeline it's at a lower pressure and this is happening you know, within within the manifold room <coughs> the oxygen uh, and other gases are uh, delivered uh, through the wall so this are where the pipeline comes out and there where you'll find the quick couplers uh, so the pipe gases are like i said at uh, 4 bar or 400 kpo 60 psi and uh, you can actually see the attachments uh, to which you can actually see the oxygen the nitrous oxide air and there is also vacuum and you can on the right side very much right side that is a scavenging system so uh, these are all uh, the quick couplers you can uh, attach these uh, pipes uh, very quickly you can actually see they're color coded so you can see white uh, pipe and the white uh, the shredder coupler the blue for the nitrous oxide uh, black and white uh, for the air uh, yellow uh, uh, for the uh, uh, you know the suction and uh, there is the you know yellow with black uh, with the, which is actually a very broad one so that is not a quick coupler uh, that is a, a screw threaded one uh, for the scavenging system it's it's much much bigger uh, than the other pipes they can be independent uh, type as well so they're hanging from the wall again but they actually uh, these are also quick couplers so these are shredder quick couplers uh, which are all from the wall and at the back of the machine we have uh, the something called uh, the NIST non-interchangeable screw threads or these are known as diameter index safety system and um, 
We will also see the pin index safety system at the back of the machine, and uh, we are that is uh, the for the cylinders. The air can actually also come at a much higher pressure of 700 kPa or uh, 7 bar. This is used for driving the pneumatic drills used by orthopedic surgeon or you know the saw, the pneumatic saw. Uh, but these can be further. We have, if you have a, uh, have a pressure regulator, you can bring it down to 4 kPa. But you need that kind of a power. So that um, should not be attached to the machine because that can actually damage uh, the uh, system, the pressure system, so the valves on the machine. So that's a much higher pressure, so you need to be careful. It's showing it uh, the same thing that here. You can actually, this is 700 kPa, but uh, using the pressure regulator, you can actually see on the pipe, which is 400 kPa. So <clears throat> that is a pressure regulating valve which has brought down the pressure from 700 to 400 kPa. On the back of the machine, you will see the yoke block or hanger yoke, uh, which will actually have the pin index system, so you can actually see the pins, uh, the borox seals, and sometimes you can also see a, a blanking plug, uh, which uh, is used if the cylinder is not attached to the machine. Uh, this is the hanger yoke assembly, and here you can actually see the nitrous oxide cylinder has been walled off using uh, the blanking plug. Uh, you can actually see uh, oxygen cylinders uh, as well. This is an old machine, so you can actually also see a carbon dioxide cylinder, which you will not see nowadays uh, on the machines. Um, <clears throat> this is a closer view of the nitrous oxide uh, blanking uh, plug. Uh, so like I said, the uh, cylinders is attached uh, to uh, the machine uh, using the uh, cylinder yoke block assembly which has got the uh, the pin index system these are non interchangeable uh, pisss so pin index safety system uh, but from the pipeline uh, there is uh, non interchangeable screw threads so nist uh, so that is for the pipeline inlet uh, the air safety, there is safety within the system. So if you look at the way the pins are, uh, are actually uh, arranged for different gases, and so show one finger and five fingers in the hand. So you have one and five for air, uh, two and five for oxygen, and three and five for nitrous oxide. I think you need to remember at least these three, and seven is for Antonox. So you need to actually remember this pin index uh, system. There is all for Heliox. Uh, with different concentration, uh, four and six and two and four. Uh, <clears throat> so these pins are actually attached uh, on a circle, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, has a diameter of nine by 16 uh, on that. So the seven holes are positions um, on a circumference of a circle of nine by 16 inch radius uh, centered on the, on the port. And these pins, if you look at it, and the uh, the pins are standard pins of four millimeter di and uh, six millimeter long, um, except uh, for the uh, the pin seven, uh, which is slightly thicker uh, than um, the standard pins. Pins. Okay. Next, we'll talk about cylinders, and uh, cylinders are important, and uh, you need to you know the sizes, volume and pressures, uh, the various components, the materials made of, how they're tested. These are all important for the uh, your examination purposes. You also, for the liquid nitrous oxide, you also need to know what is the filling ratio is, what is the definition of a filling ratio. So it's a weight of a substance with which it is actually uh, filled, that is like liquid nit uh, nitrous oxide. By the weight of water, it can hold and uh, in temperate, this is 0 0.75 uh, uh, because temperatures are lower, whereas in uh, the tropical is 0 0.67. And that's understood because temperatures are higher and the liquid uh, organ nitrous oxide can get converted to gaseous form very easily. So it's only 67% in tropical, 75% in cases temperate climates. So if you look at the uh, uh, cylinder pressures, you need to just remember uh, three values. So if you look at uh, the oxygen, helium, air, uh, antinox, or heliox, they are all at uh, 1987 psi or 137 bar, except for nitrous oxide, which is at 638 psi or 44 bar, 
and carbon dice, which is at 725 psi and 50 bar. So for pressures, cylinder pressure, it is very, very simple. So you need to just know three values, uh, 1987 psi and uh, 638 for nitrous oxide, 725 for carbon dioxide. Or easier to remember in bars, okay, so uh, 137 bar for most of the uh, gases except for nitrous oxide which is 44 and uh, carbon dioxide which is at 50 bar. Coming to the volumes of cylinders, there are various sizes of cylinders. You actually have to remember is a D uh, type cylinder. So if you give a value of 1 uh, for D, then E is twice the D. F is four times the D, G is uh, 10 times D, and J is 20 times D, whereas C is half of D. So for example, if you look at the uh, oxygen cylinder, it has got 340 liters for D. If it is times is twice 340, which is uh, 680. Four times for F type, which is the 340 into 4, 1360. 10 times for G, which is 340 into 10, this 3400 and 20 times for J, which is 340 into 20, this is 6800. You also need to remember that oxygen uh, cylinders are available in J types, which will have hold 6800 liters of oxygen. Nitrous oxide is available in G, and so is antonox. So nitrous oxide, antonox, you know, they are uh, available at 9000 uh, liters, and uh, antonox at 5000 liters. Air is also available at J-type cylinder, which is 6,400 liters. So these are some values you need to actually remember for cylinders. And did you know that currently an average 800-bed teaching hospital consumes around 500 million liters of oxygen per year? That's a huge amount. And you would think, oh, this is going to cost a lot. No, but the, if you're using a VIE, and then the actual cost per liter is around 0 0.0008. Okay, 0 0.0008 pence per liter in the UK. So it is it is pretty cheap and that is good for us, that oxygen uh, which is required for the body. So it's not that costly. Okay. So uh, how are the, uh, the uh, cylinders tested? This we need for the exam purposes. Uh, so every hundred uh, cylinder is cut into strips and uh, test at the manufacturers for tensile strength so they look at you know what pressure required to actually break it and each cylinder is tested every five years to uh, withstand high pressures so it's about 200 to 250 bar and uh, like i mentioned that the uh, pressure inside a oxygen cylinder is only 137 bar uh, whereas a nitrous oxide and common access cylinders it is 44 uh, and 50 bar respectively. So this is hydraulic test. So you have tensile strength, uh, which you will actually strip or actually then, you know, just stretched out and see when the break. There is also internal inspection. So you look at, you actually uh, have endoscope with lights in like you do a bronchoscopy or endoscopy and look at any cracks within the inside of the cylinder as well. So that was um, about the supply. Now coming to the processing, uh, we will be talking about the pressure regulators, the flow meters, uh, vaporizers. Okay, so the oxygen actually has, uh, or the cylinder in nitrous oxide, uh, they are at high pressure and they need to be brought down to low pressure. And this is done by pressure regulators. Okay. Uh, the pressure in the cylinders, uh, like, uh, we said this is at uh, a very high pressure they need to be brought down to uh, almost 45 psi 3 atmosphere so the pressure coming in the in the pipeline is at 4 atmosphere or 60 psi so it's higher whereas in the uh, cylinders it is brought down to only 3 atmosphere or, or 45 psi so the machine will preferentially uh, use and uh, the uh, pipelines uh, you know, so even if you actually leave the uh, cylinders open, uh, then because the pressure from the cylinders is lower, and uh, they cannot empty out. So this is one of the safety features uh, which is used. So oxygen cylinders need to be left open, and they won't empty as long as the pipeline uh, is is there is pressure within the pipeline. 
as the pressure in the pipeline likely drops, then they can start using the, the cylinders at the back of the machine. So how do the pressure regulators work? They work on the principle of the uh, uh, that force is, is equal to pressure into area because the pressure is defined as force acting over unit area and therefore force is a product of pressure acting over area. And so a greater pressure uh, times a smaller area will be balanced by smaller pressure uh, times the area. So if you look at the, uh, you know, how uh, the uh, pressure regulators are designed, uh, so we have two chambers, so we have a high pressure chamber and a low pressure chamber. The cylinder is attached at uh, 1987 uh, bar, uh, sorry, PSI uh, to the high pressure chamber. Uh, this is acting over a smaller area, so uh, capital P uh, times a smaller area, acts on a larger disk area, and hence what we get is a lower pressure or 45 PSI. So the common force acting is the spring, okay, that is the force which balances both sides. And uh, this is preset in the factory for different uh, you know, cylinders because the pressure uh, in the nitrous oxide cylinder will be different from that in the oxygen cylinder. And uh, hence the pressure or the force by the spring will be different uh, for a pressure regulator uh, for nitrous oxide than for the oxygen. So there are actually various face, uh, safety uh, features uh, within the machine itself. Okay, and then uh, we need to know what these safety features are within machines. So we discussed about Schroeder connectors. So these are color coded. We saw the tubings were color uh, specific. The cylinders are color specific. I talked about the non-interchangeable screw thread uh, system, uh, also known as the diameter index safety system. So these are where the uh, pipes uh, are actually attached. The pipelines are attached. Uh, to the machine, so the diameter of the your attachment to the nitrous oxide will be different from that of the oxygen. Whereas the cylinders actually have the pin index safety system, so you cannot actually attach the oxygen cylinder uh, to the nitrous oxide yoke block, and the other way around. There are also one way valves to prevent retrograde flows. I've already explained that the pressure within the pipeline is greater than in, uh, by the cylinders. That is after they are reduced, pressure reduced. So the pipeline is at least at the four uh, bar, and uh, that is around 60 psi. Uh, whereas the cylinders uh, actually are reduced to pressure of three psi, a uh, three bar of 45 psi. So preferentially, the machines will use the pipeline pressure, the uh, pipeline source. Then we have flow meters, which which reduce the uh, pressure further within the system. And you can actually see the uh, the knobs are uh, color coded and they're different size and different shapes and textures. Oxygen is upstream and I'll tell you about uh, these flow meters again. They're hypoxic guard within the system like the chain link or electronic equivalent of chain links. And uh, oxygen tend to enter uh, the last. It does not mat matter whether it is upstream or downstream. It is the last gas to come out from the uh, the gas outlet. And I'll tell you again about that. There is oxygen uh, uh, flush, uh, which delivers oxygen at around 35 to 60, 50 to 60 liters per minute. There is oxygen failure warning devices, uh, which uh, sounds the Ritchie's whistle uh, or uh, electronic equivalent. Uh, there are ventilator alarms like disconnection, high pressure airway alarms. There are monitors alarms for the FiO2, internal CO2, and other physiological alarms. This is something that which you can set the limits. And obviously, the uh, there are anti-static wheels on the machine um, to prevent any any uh, you know the discharge of elect uh, the you know electrostatic uh, you know forces. Uh, so coming to the oxygen supply uh, pressure failure devices, and these are pneumatic or electronic alarm devices, uh, which will sound up as soon as the pneumatic pressure is less than 20 or uh, 30 to 20 PSI. And um, this will sound within five seconds of the fall in, uh, in the pressure. So the oxygen supply uh, uh, pressure failure devices or fail-safe valve systems, uh, uh, basically here, and they are controlled by the oxygen supply, uh, which will open and close 
uh, the other supply so this will control the nitrous oxide uh, so that you cannot get a hypoxic mixture so as soon as the oxygen pressure drops below 20 psi it shuts off the nitrous oxide supply and then we also have oxygen failure protection devices and, and this work on uh, variable flow proportionality principle so pressure of all our gases decrease in proportion to oxygen pressure and I will likely explain this in a little bit more details. So one of the older system was called the link 25. Uh, so the oxygen and nitrous oxide were linked to each other. So you can actually see that there are 14 teeth on the nitrous oxide and there are 28 teeth on the oxygen. Oxygen is at 14 psi uh, whereas nitrous oxide 26 psi. So the nitrous oxide uh, cannot be switched on uh, without the uh, oxygen or uh, if you actually uh, try to shut off the nitrous as uh, the oxygen the nitrous oxide will also fall proportionally okay. so this was that it also ensured that uh, there was a constant flow as long as the pipeline and the oxygen cylinders are on there was a constant flow of around 200 to 250 uh, liters uh, sorry mls of uh, uh, oxygen per a minute is, is constantly delivered in this system uh, as long as the machines are switched on. This is the electronic uh, or version of the uh, pneumatic version of the oxygen failure device which is uh, talking about this is a proportionating device. So what happens here is you, you can actually see that the oxygen acting on a 50 psi uh, acts on the spring and uh, and this is open, so nitrous oxide is also delivered at 50 psi. But as the pressure falls to 25 psi, and the spring uh, uh, will likely close, start closing the valve, and the pressure of nitrous oxide will also reduce to 25 psi, proportionately reduced. And when there is no oxygen supply to that, the, the, the valve is shut off, so there will be no oxygen. So no oxygen, no nitrous oxide, no hypoxic uh, you know mixture being delivered this is showing that in a, a much uh, simpler way here so you can actually see the oxygen uh, comes to the flow meter as well as uh, to this proportionating device it pushes the spring and nitrous oxide is able you know able to deliver to the flow meter but when the uh, pressure is low the spring will force to shut the uh, nitrous oxide so there is no nitrous oxide being delivered uh, when the there is reduced pressure from the oxygen. So you cannot actually give the hypoxic mixture. Flow meters, you actually all have seen, they can be ball type or they can be the rotating floats. Uh, there are different types of flow meters. Uh, but the basic uh, you know design is uh, called Thorpe's juice and it has got a needle valve and valve seat and you can likely see the weight of the bobbins or the floats uh, is different for different gases and uh, uh, so uh, this is the first equation I was talking about here and the you know uh, if you look at uh, the flow meter the flow meter uh, will uh, move up now this is the tube is narrow at the bottom and wider at the top so it looks like a tube Top tube is actually tubular at the bottom and hence the flow is proportionate to viscosity. So it is the flow is more as laminar. Uh, laminar flow is more uh, dependent on the viscosity. But as you go up and the tube becomes uh, more annular. Okay, so it's like a ring and the uh, uh, diameter is uh, more than the length of the uh, uh, tube. So this is annular and in this case the uh, flow becomes turbulent and turbulent flow is dependent on density. So proportionate, the flow is proportionate to density and obviously proportionate to the pressure. So how, how does this flow actually work and, uh, and this is uh, based on the again uh, says uh, force is equal to mass into acceleration. So mass of the bobbin and acceleration is because of the gravity acting on this mass so that is force one the next force is actually is is because of the uh, the pressure of the gas acting on the area of the bobbin okay so these two balance out each other so uh, 
this is this is the principle on that so when you actually increase the flow the pressure increases then the float is move moves up you reduce the pressure the uh, force acting uh, over the area of the bobbin reduces and it flows comes down so again the same principle as i've explained in the uh, pressure regulating valve now the design of the uh, you know the uh, flow meters so it was thought that oh uh, the oxygen should not be on the upstream because uh, if there is actually a break in the air uh, or the other flow meters, then the oxygen can leak out through that and you can actually get more nitrous oxide. And this is the uh, pre, uh, you know, oxygen safety de devices. And then say, and same thing if the oxygen was in the middle and if there is a break, then again, the oxygen can leak out and this can deliver to oxygen. So there was a move to make the oxygen uh, downstream okay so nitrous oxide went upstream or air went upstream so even if they'll break then nitrous oxide or air will leak out and the oxygen will remain the same so no oxygen was but then there were still actually instances of where people were like delivering uh, full nitrous oxide and the reason being that we were so used to having oxygen upstream that uh, we would actually shut off uh, the uh, uh, you know the uh, oxygen and uh, uh, they only be delivering the nitrous oxide. So we went back to the old system of actually having the oxygen upstream. And uh, so this is what we actually are used to and that's what happened. So why this? And this is the solution was very simple. We said, okay, let oxygen be delivered separately to the air and nitrous oxide. So the oxygen is delivered directly uh, to the gas, common gas outlet. So that solves all the problems. So we don't actually have to worry about where the oxygen uh, flow meter is going to be. It can be upstream, it can be downstream. It doesn't actually matter at all. You can actually have it wherever you want to have it. So next come the back uh, bar, and this is where you will actually find the vaporizers. Uh, you will see the seating for the uh, vaporizers and there is uh, the o-rings on that which are important because these can actually lead to leaks when we test the machines so these need to be checked so you can actually see them you can also uh, see uh, the other features safety features uh, okay uh, on the back bar as well um, uh, the other thing which is there on the back bar are the non-return valves and the pressure relief valve uh, so you can actually see at the back bar, uh, if the pressure uh, in that goes up, it will shut off the non-return valve. So the back bar is not damaged or the flow is not happening uh, into the vaporizer. So there's no back pressure into the vaporizer. Also, if you actually shut the, uh, you know, the common gas outlet, uh, this will lead to the relief of pressure. And uh, this is, these valves are set at around 30 to 40 kPa. So the uh, gases will leak out so these are non-return and pressure relief valve uh, which again you will see on the uh, your back flow the other uh, system we have is something called a richie whistle uh, this is for low pressure so richie whistle basically is powered by a, a oxygen reservoir uh, a cylinder small cylinder so the oxygen is not only flowing to the flow meter but also to this uh, uh, oxygen reservoir and uh, this is like a white cylinder which is seen inside so that got filled up it pushes the uh, spring and uh, there is no flow to the whistle but when the pressure drops so normally the pressure is more than 60 psi uh, 4 bar so when it is reduced to uh, uh, less than 30 psi and uh, then the spring uh, moves back and uh, the reservoir oxygen from the reservoir will actually power the whistle the richie whistle and you'll hear uh, till the pressure drops to around 6 psi so that is actually a safety system within that so this is the working principle this is opposite of your uh, pressure regulator so you have high pressure attached to the low pressure chamber this pushes the uh, diaphragm up and closes the flow to the richie whistle but when the the uh, pressure drops the spring will push the uh, uh, you know the small opening um, on the diaphragm will open and the gases can flow uh, through the Ritchie whistle and uh, 
till the oxygen uh, in the you know accessory cylinder is emptied or the pressure dropped to 6 psi next thing we have vaporizers are the back bar um, again the vaporizers have evolved from simple boil bottle or the cold vaporizers they have become uh, more sophisticated we have the tech 5 tech 6 tech 7 uh, tech 6 is uh, especially for the um, desflurane uh, whereas the tech 5 tech uh, 7 uh, these are the uh, usual uh, plenum vaporizer and uh, as we know, there are various safety features uh, within vaporizers. I have done a lecture on vaporizers where I have explained uh, you the various uh, features within the vaporizers. So these are tech vaporizers, plenum vaporizers, uh, where uh, the uh, regulation of the output concentration is by variable bypass. And um, this uh, vaporization by flow over. There is temperature compensation by flow alteration using a bimetallic strip or bellows. Uh, and uh, there are also agent specific. So you have a price for uh, sevoflurane, for enfluorane, for, you know, have uh, halothane. And these vaporizers are outside the breathing system, not within the breathing, these are outside the breathing system. This Texic vaporizer is, is not a plenum vaporizer and this is a electrically heated, uh, thermostatically controlled uh, constant temperature at 40 degrees. And it is uh, a, a vaporizer which is pressurized to two atmosphere. It has dual circuits, so you have the, the fresh gas flows and the flows from the your um, vaporizer chamber which are linked uh, by electromechanical mechanical coupling uh, so as the uh, you increase the flow the flow output from the vaporizer also increases and these get blended together uh, to give the ultimate concentration of the vaporizer so this is the tech 6 uh, vaporizer ultimately the gases come out uh, from the gas outlet or oxygen flush sorry the common and there is an oxygen flush as well there near to the common gas outlet which bypasses the your flow meter. So you can actually deliver oxygen at a very high flows, anywhere from 35 to 60 liters uh, per uh, minute uh, flows. And these are important when you're dealing with uh, something like laryngospasm, you have to deliver uh, flows, uh, very high flows. Uh, there can be, again, other systems within that. This is actually a flow sensor, and this is a diode-based flow sensor. And, uh, it uh, has got uh, photodiodes on one side, detectors on side, the vein. So as the flow increases, uh, the vein actually, uh, you know, uh, it rotates, cuts the beam, and the faster the beam cuts that, the greater the flow detected uh, by the system. You can also have, uh, uh, you know, these volumetric uh, and uh, the uh, sensors uh, which use differential pressures. So this is another type of that. And there, so this is heating coil with different pressure transducers, or they can be screen guard. They work on this uh, principle of just uh, the differential, looking at differential, or they can be a manual ones. Uh, on uh, this is the old old types uh, of the, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but then the other things which is there in the machines and uh, which are now integral part. Here it is shown as a separate. This is on an old machine, uh, data exometer or old, old machines. This is oxygen analyzers. These are a very, very important part uh, of the machines uh, integral. Then obviously you attach a breathing system to them. They can be circle uh, systems, uh, which I use a soda lime. And uh, you should know what are the constant of the soda limes are and what are the reactions uh, which happen when a carbon dioxide comes in uh, contact with soda lime, how the heat is generated, how water is generated. So humidification is maintained, uh, temperature is maintained. You should know what the indicators are. So if you look at uh, the indicators uh, where uh, the deep pink uh, becomes off-white, one, the soda lime get exhausted. These are Clayton yellow and Tata yellow are the indicators. But if it is white, then it you need to know whether it is ethyl violet, where the white will turn to purple, uh, phenolphthalein, where white will turn to pink. So there are other indicators as well. You should be able to actually draw the circle 
uh, system in the exam. So circle is a circle, connect to patient, the sore line, fresh gas flow, reservoir bag, APL valve, one-way valve, inspiratory and expiratory one-way valve. You can also attach peep valves to the uh, system. This is comes actually as uh, attachment. Uh, but then if, if you're using ventilator, it is integral part of the ventilators. You can set the peep within the ventilators. Uh, this is where there was no ventilators. The other breathing systems, and this is a coaxial and your uh, Mapleson D or Bain system, uh, which actually has an uh, outer diameter of 22 millimeters in R14, and this is 180 centimeters in length. And, and this is also got an APL valve. You should know about APL valve. So when it is fully uh, open, it opens up at a very low pressure, 50 PA or 0.5 centimeters of water. Uh, this is a peep valve, which you can likely get to attach if you don't have a ventilator. You should know the working principle of an APL valve. APL valve is basically like a T-piece. Uh, it's got knife edge on which you have a disc with a stem and there is a spring on that and the pressure on the spring can be adjusted by the cap okay so when the flow uh, comes in the pressure uh, over unit area becomes flow okay and uh, this force is uh, balanced out by the force of the spring acting on the uh, disc with the stem okay so you should know so the principle actually is same as that I've explained it is the uh, in a principle of that uh, the pressure is equal force force is equal okay pressure and force and area is equal pressure is equal to force acting on unit area and that's why force is equal to pressure into area that principle is held uh, this is the old uh, Mapleson A and uh, or Megal system at it was known as this was uh, 110 centimeters uh, and could hold a volume of 550 ml and this is uh, the Mapleson uh, D or the water circuit you should also know how to draw them so a wiggly line uh, is the tubing and that is a face mask you got the APL valve you got the reservoir bag and the fresh gas flow so this is Mapleson A and uh, B and uh, uh, you know C are similar uh, C is also known as water circuit and uh, the B just has got a long tubing attached to it and you can actually see here the APL valve and the fresh gases are very close to the patient so they're easy to adjust but these are very inefficient system then D and F are, are T pieces that means the uh, flow of oxygen is actually very close to the patient and this is Mapleson D, which has got a bag with APL valve. Mapleson E uh, has got no uh, bag. It is open-ended system. And Mapleson D has got a bag with an open system. Sorry, F has got an open bag system, or also known as jackson reese modification of E. And Mapleson D, like I said, can be uh, you know coaxial system and non-coaxial system, but the uh, the working principle remains the same. The fresh gases are delivered next to the patient. These are just T pieces. This is just another uh, configuration of that. We also have suction on the um, attached to the machines. Uh, this is part of the anesthesia practice. You need to always have a suction, especially when you're doing rapid sequence induction. You can have ventilators. This is an old type of ventilators. I have actually taken a class on ventilator. I will actually also post this later. And there can be other more modern ventilators. This is uh, better than the other one. This is both the uh, Manly. Uh, this is the Penlon. Uh, but the newer ventilators are a lot more sophisticated. They are part of the machine or the workstations now. And so ventilator scavenging are another lecture. And um, uh, with this, uh, we will end the lecture. And thank you for listening uh, to this lecture.